Pennsylvania's next governor will face many challenges. Crumbling road conditions, proposed bridge tolls, and controversy over fair election practices. Tonight on One Stage, the front-running Republicans who want to be your next governor. Lou Barletta, Doug Mastriano, Dave White, and Bill McSwain. Live from your local election headquarters in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, this is the Pennsylvania Republican primary gubernatorial debate. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Dennis Owens with ABC 27 News in Harrisburg. And I'm Lisa Sylvester with WPXI Channel 11 News in Pittsburgh. We are broadcasting and streaming live across every county in the Commonwealth. The four Republican candidates standing on the stage tonight have met our eligibility requirements, each hoping to become the next governor of Pennsylvania. So here are the rules for tonight's debate. Each candidate will get 60 seconds to answer a question. The candidate will get 30 seconds to answer if there's a follow up or a rebuttal. And if a clarification is needed, they will have 15 seconds. And we will remind the candidates throughout the night of those times. The sound of a bell will ring when their time is up. Our bell ringer is ready. As you can hear, the candidates are ready. You are watching tonight's debate from one of our next our media stations across the state and our partner station in Pittsburgh, WPXI TV. All right, let's get right to the issues. In January, we saw the Fern Hollow Bridge collapse in Pittsburgh. It's one example of the Commonwealth's crumbling infrastructure. Pennsylvania also has one of the highest gas taxes in the country at 58 cents, which largely funds road and bridge repairs. Beginning with you, Mr. Barletta, you have complained about the poor condition of roads and bridges in Pennsylvania and the tax burden on Pennsylvanians. If gas taxes are cut, how would you make up the shortfall? You have 60 seconds. Yeah, sure. I served on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee while I was in, in Congress. Actually, I was a chairman of a subcommittee. And uh, what I found interesting is that on the federal gas tax, that only 30% of the tax that we were paying actually goes to fixing our roads and bridges. Uh, I'm very interested to see here in Pennsylvania of the gas tax that we have that how much of that money is actually going towards fixing our roads and bridges and how much is going elsewhere. The first thing I would do is review that and if the money isn't going where it's supposed to go then it should and if it's not going to then we should eliminate that portion. Taxpayers shouldn't be paying the tax on something that that it's not going to where it should be going to. The second thing I think we need to do it's very important is take the state police uh, out of the uh, uh, highway fund, put it in the general fund as its own line item. That'll free up over $300 million to fix our infrastructure. We need a reoccurring revenue for our infrastructure here in Pennsylvania. And as somebody who uh, was a mayor and had to fix the potholes, I know a little bit about it. All right, thank you. Mr. Mastriano, you proposed a bill that would reduce the gas tax for drivers for six months. If you were to do that, how do you propose to fund much needed repairs and to recoup some of that lost revenue? You too have 60 seconds. Yeah, the, the infrastructure in Pennsylvania and, and that bridge image you showed from Pittsburgh uh, from a couple months ago is very telling. It's a, it's a public safety issue. Uh, my wife had a friend actually hit a pothole and it threw into the op opposite traffic and killed her. So th this is something that the government really needs to take care of. The problem is in 2013 when Act 89 was passed, we were told this is going to be the pandemic. Panacea. Yes, it's a big tax. I was still a colonel in the army, had nothing to do with that. It's a big tax, but it's going to fix our roads and bridges. But just like every other empty promise, like with property taxes and gambling in 2004 under Rundell, you know, gambling in Pennsylvania will get rid of property taxes. We were lied to. This happened too. 40% of the funds, $600 million in the first year, was siphoned off uh, for the retirement fund for the state police. And so the money needs to go where we're told it needs to go. So. Uh, my gas holiday tax was actually because of Biden inflation and the spike, of course, in gas prices. And that, that needed to happen back then. But the bottom line is if we spend the money where it needs to go, we can take care of the resources and get the bridges and roads where they need to be. It needs to happen. I'm tired of the talk and the dithering on the political side. All right. Thank you. Turning to you, Mr. White, you said you would suspend the uh, gas tax immediately. In 60 seconds, how long would you suspend the tax for and what is your plan to fund road and bridge repairs? Well, I believe I did not say that. But uh, with that being said, the fuel tax is, a, is an important way to get infrastructure fixed. And uh, as been said, we've taken $5 billion, $5 billion in the past uh, seven years out of that tax and moved it to the general fund to balance the budget. That has to be used for infrastructure. It has to be used for uh, broadband. Uh, we need good infrastructure to get businesses and commerce to come back to Pennsylvania. I will be a governor that gets that done. We also have to go through that department, the Pen uh, PennDOT. We have to make sure we're getting every dime's worth uh, that we're putting in there. We have to go through the regulations, make sure we're not being overregulated in PennDOT. I know we are. We have to uh, get rid of some of those regulations so we can get uh, the roads and bridges fixed. 
the permitting is out of control. It's taken two years to get permits for these bridges and roads. That has to be shortened. That shortening that time limit uh, makes this less expensive and gets things done. I've been talking about that for many months. I'm going to get our roads and bridges fixed again, and we're going to have some honest budgeting when I'm governor. A uh, 15 second clarification. Do you believe that the gas tax should be cut e either on a temporary basis or on a permanent basis? If, if we need to cut gas tax, we need to find other revenue because we have to fix our roads and bridges. You just showed an example of a bridge that had collapsed, uh, and, and uh, they are a danger. Our infrastructure is terrible in Pennsylvania and needs fixed. If we, if we cut the gas tax, we need to follow, find other revenue. All right. Forward. Thank you very much. Turning to you, Mr. McSwain, you told the Philadelphia Inquirer you would implement a, quote, permanent and drastic reduction of the gas tax. How much would you cut and how would you fund bridge and road improvements? 60 seconds, sir. Well, first of all, what you've just heard is a bunch of double talk from three politicians. They say one thing and then they do another. That's why people don't trust politicians. What we need in Pennsylvania is a conservative outsider as governor to deal with the infrastructure problems and everything else. I'm a U.S. Marine. I'm a federal prosecutor. I've lived a life of public service. But unlike these guys, I am not a politician. I have never run for office before. So let's start with Senator Mastriano, since he's right here to my right. He claims to be a fiscal conservative, but look at his record. He has voted again and again for Governor Wolf's spending increases. He has also proposed a huge increase in the state personal income tax. And worst of all, he has proposed a COVID registry. So if he were governor, our personal medical information would have been broadcast out to the world. That's bad for Pennsylvania, and we're not going to do that when I'm governor. All right, I'll give uh, 30 seconds to Mr. Mastriano to respond. Yeah, nonsense is still nonsense, especially especially when it's spoken from an attorney. Uh, I'm not a career politician. I retired from the Army as a colonel just a few years ago. Uh, could have ridden off to the sunset, but of course, I uh, saw duty bound to, to serve my country in its capacity. Only combat veteran here. Only one here in front that did something about voting integrity. My, my colleague here had the opportunity, and as Donald Trump said, he, cow he chickened out. He, he was a coward, had a chance, had my hearing in Gettysburg for voting integrity, and left me hanging. And so it's, it's time, you know, enough talk and, and doublespeak. I'm proven bold leadership. I stood alone over the past two All years. All right, we're going to move on. We'll May circle I clarify? Back. Well, we're going to touch on we this in just a minute, so stay right that. there. Dennis. Let's turn to the topic of electability and the Donald Trump factor. And Mr. Mastriano, we're going to begin with you. 61% of Republican voters polled say a Trump endorsement does matter when it comes to getting their vote. Mr. Mastriano, you've been a loyal Trump supporter calling for an investigation into the 2020 election, even holding a hearing in Gettysburg where the former president phoned in. Why do you think Donald Trump has not yet endorsed you? You have 60 seconds. Well, well, you know, I share a lot of the common issues with Donald Trump and the people of Pennsylvania. And I know he's, he's not real liked in the traditional media, president company accepted, I guess, but uh, uh, electability. So when we're going around the state to get on the ballot, we're required 2,000 signatures. Some of the men on the stage here had to pay two to five hundred dollars a page for 30 signatures a page. My volunteers collected 29,000 signatures across the state. While the, the electability was during that process, there we converted thousands of Democrats to vote for me. And so, although I might be paying it one way in the media, the reality is they see somebody here who's a, who's a lifelong soldier who dedicated most of his 20s, all his 30s, all his 40s, and part of his 50s in uniform, serving four combat deployments. They see a veteran. Uh, Pennsylvania has one of the highest veteran populations in the nation, around 6 or 7%, and the family members respect that. They also see somebody blue-collar who had to work for a living. My dad was a high school dropout, served the United States Navy, and uh, they see somebody they can relate to. I, worked, I was a janitor and did blue-collar jobs as a union member and, and had to work my way uh, to the top. There was no silver spoon given to me, unlike Governor Wolf. And what they see is leadership and bold action, no talk. Mr. Mastriano, 30-second follow-up for, for some that goes to electability. Today, the Philadelphia Inquirer reported you attended a conference last week in Gettysburg hosted by a couple who publicly call themselves prophets of QAnon. What can you tell us about that? And do you consider yourself a member of that group? 30 seconds. Yeah, it's funny how the media likes to paint anyone they disagree with on the right on the conservative side as some kind of extremist. I, d I don't know that those two ever said that. I was there, of course, speaking with many of my constituents and people from across the state, and it's very unfair. And, and people across the state are sick and tired of being labeled something because you disagree with them politically. Okay, thank you. Mr. White, turning to you, you have 60 seconds. Your own political ads call you a Trump conservative. Have you ever spoken to the former president? Have you asked for his endorsement? And why have you not thus far earned it? 
No, I have talked to the president, certainly, and I'd uh, love to have his endorsement. He's done some great things. He's put uh, America first, as I will put Pennsylvania first. Uh, he's brought the contingency and the uh, group that I'm bringing together, the blue-collar workers, the hard-working men and women that are out there every day, like I am, a pipe fitter. He brought them into our party. They, they voted with, uh, for him in outstanding numbers, and that's why I'm electable. Uh, the most electable uh, person up on this stage, because I'm most like the people of Pennsylvania. I'm a, I'm a steam fitter, a pipe fitter, uh, a, a member that is going out there and works hard every day. Uh, came out of high school, Votex student, and grew an $85 million a year, year business with that kind of education, because that's hard work. That's what the opportunity of uh, America is and the promise of Pennsylvania, as I say. Uh, but, yeah, uh, we are the most electable person because we are bringing more people into this party than anyone else on this stage. I'm going to continue doing that uh, when I'm governor. Thank you. Let's shift to Mr. McSwain. You were appointed by President Trump to be U.S. attorney, but he recently released a statement urging voters not to vote for you, an unendorsement of sorts. Mr. McSwain, you have 60 seconds. Without Trump's support, what is your path forward? First of all, I'm proud of my record as U.S. attorney. I serve President Trump's law and order agenda. I put rioters and looters in jail. I put violent criminals in jail. I put corrupt public officials in jail. I stopped heroin injection sites from invading Pennsylvania neighborhoods. I pushed back against Philadelphia's dangerous sanctuary city policies. All day, every day, I was standing up for the law-abiding citizens of this Commonwealth. And that's also what I would do as governor. And going back to the, the comment previously, let me just say this. I don't need a lecture from anybody about courage or toughness. I served our country as a United States Marine Corps infantry officer and scout sniper platoon commander. And I know Doug served as well, and I respect that. But as an Army officer, I know you also spent your career wishing you were a Marine. 15 <laughs> I, I want to do a 15 second follow up. What get, is your I path forward? I get to forward? respond on behalf uh, of the okay, but, <laughs> what, is your, what, what is your path forward without uh, Trump's endorsement? In fact, his unendorsement. 15 seconds. I'm the only candidate who actually served in the Trump administration. He, he appointed me to a very important job having to do with public safety. And what I want to do and what I will do in this race is unite the entire party. We need everybody. <laughs> to vote in the election, and I can unite all facets of the party. Thank you. Mr. Barletta, 2016. Sorry, please, oh, I'm sorry, 15 to seconds to you. Go you. ahead. You want to, uh, Army pride. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you. You know, when I was young in the Army and had a couple years in, we used to joke around with the other services, but ha having been the only combat veteran up here and serving in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and seeing what the Joint Force could do, I put that all aside. So uh, members in the United States, the Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, and now Space Force, I welcome your vote and support because I'm standing with you. Thank you. Mr. Barletta, in 2016, you were one of the first sitting congressmen to endorse Donald Trump. In 2018, as president, he endorsed you in your run for U.S. Senate. Why have you not thus far gotten the endorsement this time around? 60 seconds. Well, you know, first of all, everyone knows where I stood with, with Donald Trump. I was one of the first in the country in Congress to, to endorse him. I actually co-chaired his campaign with uh, Tom Marino. I was on his transition team as well, and I was uh, in consideration for a cabinet position for Secretary of Transportation. Uh, you know, one thing I've learned of, about President Trump is you don't speak for him. Uh, you just keep on working hard. He wants to see who's going to work hard, who's going to win. Pennsylvania is very important. I believe that I give us the best chance to win because of my state, statewide name ID. The fact that I ran in 2018 had over 2.1 million votes. That's 20 times more votes than anybody here on the stage. Have a history of beating Democrats. Uh, the city I was mayor of, I, I won. It was two to one Democrat. I won by a two to one margin, a four to one margin, then with 90% of the vote. And when I ran for Congress, I beat a 26 year Democrat incumbent in a congressional district that's two to one Democrat. I give us the best chance to win. A 30 second follow up for you, Mr. Barletta. Even with the 2018 Trump endorsement, you lost that race to Senator Bob Casey by 13 points. Why should Republican voters believe this election would be any different? Well, because, you know, the year matters. That was a Democrat headwind. No, fa no, no kidding about that. But I won 54 of 67 counties, even though I ran statewide for the first time, although I was outspent by $14 million. Uh, it's pretty clear that from the day I announced, 
Doug Mastriano and myself have been on top of the polls and we haven't run one ad. It's just I just start running an ad actually this week. I think it's because of 2018 that people know what they're going to get. They don't have to guess what I'm going to do tomorrow because they could see what I've done yesterday. And one last quick follow up on this topic for Mr. Mastriano. You organized buses to the Capitol on January 6, 2020. You've been subpoenaed to testify before the House Committee investigating that day. To our knowledge, you have not responded to that subpoena. But what do you say to Republican voters tonight specifically who might be concerned that there are still legal issues ahead for you on that topic? Yeah, there are no legal issues. I'll, I'll delineate in the U.S. Constitution that we have five freedoms delineated in the First Amendment. The freedom of uh, religion, press, speech, assembly, and right to redress the government. Uh, I was there uh, to hear my president speak, and then I was invited to speak at two locations, ex exercising my constitutional rights. And uh, shame on the media and the Democrats for painting anyone down. There's a villain. Barack Obama said in 2016, and his station played that, said to uh, condemn a group based off the actions of one is irresponsible and wrong. And so condemning all those people that did nothing wrong, that, that's an injustice to our freedom. And, and okay. one, one other thing that was attached to this here, I noticed during the COVID shutdown, my, the, my rallies in Harrisburg to reopen the state were condemned by the station here, but you guys gave a free pass to Tom Wolf and, and Levine when they protested with, uh, in conjunction with the BLM. That's okay. East Germany right there. Okay, thank you, Lisa. All right, switching gears now we want to talk about the issue of mail-in ballots in 2020 more than 2.6 million mail-in ballots were cast that's more than a third of the total votes but right now the law is being challenged in the state supreme court so this is a raise your hand question raise your hand if you believe no excuse mail-in ballots should be eliminated okay we have all four of you we'll begin with mr white the mail-in ballot law was passed. It was supported by Republicans. Voting by mail is very popular. It's done in many other states. Why do you oppose it, and how do you make sure that everyone who has a right to vote gets to vote? 60 seconds. Because we have so many people right now that are questioning our uh, democracy and the, uh, our elections. Uh, they're not secure. They, uh, they do not believe or they have no confidence in them. And I've said this a lot. If you go back to 2019, it may not have been who you voted for. It may not have been who you wanted. But you knew who was elected on election night, and you're confident in the election. That all changed with Act 77. Who voted for that should be held accountable for it. Uh, they've allowed the mail-in ballots, no excuse mail-in ballots. They allowed the drop boxes. And uh, the, we've lost confidence in our elections. The mail-in ballots have not worked. Uh, you have to have good elections to have a good democracy. You have to have confidence in your elections to have that democracy. And it's been proven because so many people still are not uh, happy with the way the voting go went. And it's because of the no excuse mail-in ballots. We will keep the absentee ballots. If you're infirmed or you can't be in your polling place, you should have the opportunity to vote. All right. Thank you, sir. Turning to you, Mr. McSwain, same question. Why do you oppose mail-in ballots? How do you make sure everyone who has a right to vote gets to vote in 60 seconds? Well, the first reason I'm opposed to it is that it's unconstitutional. Right now, there is a court decision from the Commonwealth Court that says Act 77 is unconstitutional. And Act 77 was brought to you by Doug Mastriano. He voted for Act 77 in the legislature. It's unconstitutional. We shouldn't have it. And I'll get rid of it as governor. And let's, I want to go to the question of electability for a second, because something that Lou Barletta said caught my ear. He said, you know what you're going to get with Lou Barletta. And he's right. We do know what we're going to get. We're going to get a career politician who raises taxes, who approves increased spending, he approved Obama's budgets, and you're going to get somebody who gets wiped out in general elections. He lost by 14 points to Bob Casey, and that was a year where we picked up seats in the Senate. That was not a great Democratic year. We picked up seats as Republicans in the Senate that year, and he lost by 14 points. This election is too important. Losing is not an option. We need something different. We need a conservative outsider like me. All right, Mr. Barletta. Uh, well, first, Mr. Barletta, I'm going to give you come up here, 15 yeah. seconds to Mr. Barletta, then okay. 15 seconds Thank to you. you. When I hear someone say they're not a politician, that means they have no experience. And you want to say that I voted for Obama's budget? It's probably not as bad as you who voted for Obama. All right, Mr. Mastriano, 15 seconds. Yeah, the, the, 
lies and deception, all to get a vote and uh, dishonesty. Act 77 was hijacked by the Democrats, fact, changed by the St Pennsylvania State Supreme Court, rewritten by Wolf and Bookfar, and enabled by Zuckbucks. It looked nothing like what the Republicans voted on there unanimously on the, in the Senate. And so that's how right, it was overhauled. 15 seconds are up. Thank Mr. You. Bartlett, Can you I get now a point have of clarification. Uh, well, just... We would go back and forth. We've got to move on with this question. Mail in ballots. Mr. Barletta, 60 seconds. Why do you oppose mail in ballots? How do you make sure everyone has who has the right to vote actually gets a chance to vote, yeah, Mr. I, Barletta? I, I'm going to repeal Act 77. Listen, we know dead people have been voting in Pennsylvania all of our lives. Now they don't even have to leave the cemetery to vote. They can mail in their ballots. I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, you know, there, it's, it's ripe for fraud, ballot harvesting. Uh, we could go on and on. We have a process if you can't make it to the polls. We have a process of using the absentee ballots uh, to, to, uh, to be able to vote if you can't get to the polls. I also believe we need to have voter ID. We have to make sure we bring integrity uh, back to our elections again. All right, Mr. Mastriano, same question. Why do you now oppose mail-in ballots, and how do you make sure everyone who has the right to vote gets a chance to vote? 60 seconds. Yeah, and I have legislation in place for the I mean, Once again, Act 77 was hijacked by the Democrats. John Adams said facts are stubborn things, and they, the facts I've delineated before the Supreme Court change it. Wolf change it, book far change it. A voter ID needs to happen. I actually have a constitutional amendment co-prime with Senator Judy Ward. A poll watcher protection act I have in place so that we don't see a repeat of what happened to one of my testifiers at the Gettysburg hearing where he was forced out by somebody and the sheriff did nothing to that felony. There should be, there should be charges brought against them. You know, and reining in what happened here is Act 77 has to be repealed because it was compromised by the Democrats. That's the facts. Like I said, facts are stubborn things here. It, there's seven or eight pieces of legislation I have in to tighten up. But the most important thing is I get to appoint the Secretary of State and that Secretary of State is going to clean up the election logs. We're going to reset, in fact, uh, registration. You have to re-register. We're going to start all over again. You know, so much is at stake. I served in Afghanistan, and it's a heartbreaking thing to watch what Joe Biden did back in August with that retreat. I, I felt like I wanted to cry after three tours there. But I saw better elections in Afghanistan than in Pennsylvania. For me, this is no game. Uh, men and women that served with me didn't come home right. uh, trying to protect freedoms overseas Thank that we lost in thank Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Mastriano. Yeah. Dennis. We're going to move on to the topic of built business climate. Mr. McSwain, you'll get the first question. The Florida legislature and governor recently moved to punish Disney after the company publicly criticized a new Florida law. Mr. McSwain, you have 60 seconds. Do you think it's appropriate for state government to target a specific private sector business? And as governor, what is your message to businesses in Pennsylvania that may publicly criticize your policies? Again, 60 seconds. My message to the business community is simple. Help is on the way. You deserve a governor who's going to create a pro-business environment. So we have jobs and growth and opportunity in this state, and we need a conservative outsider to do that. We're not going to get there with these guys. We're not going to get there by taxing more, spending more, breaking promises. We need a conservative outsider. I'm the only conservative outsider. I'm the only one who is not a politician who's on the stage. And getting back to what Mr. Barletta said about me, that I voted for Obama, that's crazy. I didn't vote for Obama, but that is a typical tactic of career politicians. They make outrageous accusations in order to deflect from their own record. He's a career politician, he's a tax raiser, he's been in favor of increased spending, and when he was mayor of Hazleton, he even laid off the police. These are all things that I am never going to do as governor because I'm the true conservative in the race. Mr. Barletta, as luck would have it, we're coming to you now for the question anyway. Yeah, do you think it's appropriate for state government to take a punitive approach toward a private sector business? And as governor, what is your message to businesses in Pennsylvania that may not support your policy? 60 yeah. first, seconds. First, let me correct myself. You know, I, I was wrong and I apologize to Mr. McSwain. Uh, he didn't vote for Obama. He voted for Bill Clinton because you were a Democrat during that time. So I want to make sure we're clear about that. He's He's never created a job, so I, you know I, I don't have a lot of faith that he's going to learn uh, if he becomes governor. I've actually created jobs. Pennsylvania is not business friendly. We have one of the highest corporate net income taxes in the country. We're going to lower that. They use DEP right now as, as a weapon to stop businesses. DEP stands for don't expect permits. We're going to change all that. We're going to unleash our natural gas, get it to the world. That's our future. We, Pennsylvania will be open for business, but we need somebody who's actually created jobs who knows how to create jobs and who's actually governed. I check every box. I was a business owner. I was a mayor. I actually governed in an executive position and I served in Congress. I think that's exactly who you want to hire if you were hiring someone to run our state. Quick follow up, 15 seconds. Is it appropriate though for state government to target a specific business? Well, you know, I think, I think if, you're, if you're giving them tax breaks, I think that 
that as a state, you have the opportunity to decide whether or not they should get it or not. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Moving on to Mr. Mastriano, do you think it's appropriate for state government to take such an approach towards a private sector business? And if elected governor, what would your message be to pe businesses in Pennsylvania that may not agree with your policy? 60 seconds. Yeah, common sense. You know, right now we have a drain on workers. Kids coming to college and university are moving out. Families are losing their son and daughters to other states that are open for business, like in West Virginia, Ohio, uh, Texas. Uh, we're the number third highest uh, tax state in the nation, according to some studies. Uh, we have the second highest corporate tax at just under 10%. Uh, we have the fifth highest unemployment at 5%. I mean, this is unconscionable. The, the state is falling apart because of corrupt politicians and failed politics. Number three in the gas tax, 35 worse with regulations, 153,000 regulations. Uh, first 100 days, we're going to strip it down to about 100,000 regulations or less. That's going to save millions of dollars right away. That's going to make us uh, business friendly. And then we're going to unleash the potential of energy in Pennsylvania. No longer longer we have plants closing. We have a plant closing this year in the southwest and next year as well where I was. And we're going to have to get those plants where we pull away eight years of Wolf's regulations, his, of these fees he put on top of them, uh, open up the state lands, and also for national security as well as for the, the prosperity of New England, uh, get LNG terminals, modern ones, outside of Philly and Lake Erie as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's move to Mr. White. You're a business owner. Uh, do you think it's appropriate for state government to take a, such an approach? Uh, toward a private sector business as Florida did toward Disney and what is your message to businesses in Pennsylvania that may not agree with your policy 60 seconds sir yeah I, I do if you have special tax breaks and they did have special tax breaks uh, and I believe we uh, you need a businessman to be able to know what attracts business it, it's funny standing up here and all, all of a sudden everybody's pro business pro growth and they understand business uh, I grew a business from literally my kitchen table uh, it started with my wife, grew it, and grew it to an $85 million a year uh, business. That's from someone that has a high school education and is a pipe fitter, a blue-collar worker, just like the people of Pennsylvania. That's the opportunity we can give them, and that's the opportunity I'm going to give them. We have to cut regulations. I know that. I see it. Business wants certainty. That's what they want most of all, certainty. And they want to be able to get permits quickly, cut regulations, and growth. And if you want to talk about energy, I am the energy, will be the energy governor. I am a pipe fitter. We saved two uh, refineries in Delaware County, got them open. That's the uh, same kind of uh, work, hard work I'm going to do for the Pennsylvania people to get our energy sector moving like it's never been moved before. Good, good transition. Thank you, Lisa. All right, <laughs> on to a new topic. Uh, speaking of energy, fracking is an important industry for Pennsylvania in terms of jobs and low energy prices, but there are environmental concerns. Neighboring states have banned it. Our poll of uh, Pennsylvania voters shows support for more fracking in this state, and you all have championed local production of coal, oil, and natural gas. We begin with you, Mr. Barletta. Do you believe there should be more, less, or the same amount of fracking in Pennsylvania and why? 60 seconds. Drill, baby, drill. I mean, this is Pennsylvania's future. The first thing I'm going to do is take us out of Reggie, the regional greenhouse gas initiative. It's ludicrous to think that we would have a governor here in Pennsylvania and an attorney general who would do the same that would literally eliminate any kind of jobs we have, uh, natural gas jobs and energy jobs we have in Pennsylvania by putting us in Reggie. I'm, I'm going to take us out, out of, uh, out of uh, Reggie. Uh, immediately. We've got to build the pipelines. We've got to get this gas. We were blessed with more natural gas under our feet than any country in the world. We can be exporting LNG. Uh, instead of polluting the air in Russia with Rus Russian natural gas, we could be doing better, cleaner and better right here in Pennsylvania. But we have to build the pipelines. Having all this natural gas under our feet without building the pipelines is like being in college and having a keg of beer without a tap. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. We're going to tap into that gas. We're going to get it out to the market, and Pennsylvania will be a leader, and businesses will be moving here because of it. All right, thank you. Turning to you, Mr. Mastriano, 60 seconds. Do you believe that there should be more, less, or the same amount of fracking in Pennsylvania, and why 60 seconds? Absolutely more, and I was an Eagle Scout, so I do love the environment, and I did a study on this here. 99% of the wells are safe. There's very few wells that have leakage and have contaminated the local environment. And when I was in the Army with the top secret clearance, uh, we did some studies and the Russians were funding some of these movies that showed fracking was a very dangerous thing. Those, those are a lot of them fraud. You know it's bad in America when you're running out of a gas in the wintertime in 2018 in Boston, and instead of getting off of Pennsylvania, they bring in two ships from Siberia 4,500 miles away. So 
with these failed Democrat policies and, and these delusional environmental po policies preventing pipelines and our ability to export to our neighboring states here, we've emboldened and rich Vladimir Putin who's waging war on the beautiful people of Ukraine. It's time that we bring the jobs here, the energy here. Uh, working with Lithuania, they said they wanted to buy natural gas off of Pennsylvania, but we couldn't get it to them in suffi sufficient numbers, speaking with the former Minister of Defense, Rauza Dukovnitsa. This will safeguard our allies overseas and reduce the war, uh, the chances of war with Vladimir Putin in Russia again by taking us off of Russian oil and gas. You know, we're blessed. It's, it's time to remove Wolf's regulations on day one. We're at a Reggie on day one, and we're going to oh. open up their, our, our, our fracking like you wouldn't believe it. All right, thank you. Turning to you, Mr. White, same question. In 60 seconds, do you believe there should be more or less or the same amount of fracking here in Pennsylvania? 60 seconds and why? No, we're going to have more fracking, without a doubt. Uh, we are going to have a transportation system for that product. Uh, I'm the only one that literally has a plan that I've been talking about for six months. I actually, I talked about it on Dennis's show when I first sat with him six months ago. That will put pipelines through the right-of-ways and our turnpikes, the Northeast extensions, the interstates. That's how you get economic development across this whole, uh, this whole state. It'll take it down to the southeast where we have rivers and we have ports. We can expand that. Uh, we have to also dredge the Delaware because this, this side of the Delaware is not deep enough to load the uh, liquefied natural gas. So we have to work along with the uh, congressman uh, on that as well to get that dredged. Uh, right now you have to ship it over to uh, New Jersey and New Jersey's governor doesn't want us to do that. And I'm never going to let another governor tell Pennsylvania how they can uh, use their own resources. But we will frack. We'll get it going. That will bring an additional revenue to our state, and it will uh, grow our economy. Great paying, six-figure jobs, 50 to 60,000 of them right. very quickly. Thank you, Mr. White. Turning to you, Mr. McSwain, you heard the other candidates on the stage. They all have said more fracking. Do you believe there should be more or less or the same amount of fracking in Pennsylvania? 60 seconds. Much more. A lot more. I will be the pro-energy governor, and we're going to turn on the spigot of natural gas. I think that's the one thing, the most important thing that we can do to get our economy moving. It's going to supercharge our economy. It's going to bring jobs and prosperity to our state. There's also an element of patriotism to it because we serve national security when we are energy independent. Pennsylvania can help America be energy independent. And also, as we've seen, the tragedy unfold on our television screens about the invasion of the Ukraine. Vladimir Putin invaded the Ukraine because he thought he had leverage over the West, because he was supplying natural gas to Western Europe and to Germany and some energy to America. We in Pennsylvania should be supplying that energy. We shouldn't be giving power to tyrants. And also, it's important to recognize that this is also a green initiative. The reduction in greenhouse gases that we've seen over the last two decades have almost all been because we're burning cleaner fuels and natural gas. So if you care about the environment, you want to frack more. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Turning to the topic of abortion, Mr. Mastriano, this will start with you. The U.S. Supreme Court may overturn Roe versus Wade, leaving it up to the individual states. Right now in Pennsylvania, it is illegal to have an abortion after 24 weeks unless the life of the mother is in danger. You're all on the stage vocally pro-life. Mr. Mastriano, can you define your position and would you support abortion exceptions for rape, incest, or the life of the mother? You have 60 seconds. So in 1776, when we had our Declaration of Independence right here in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, where the light of liberty was lit, uh, our founding fathers with great vision and de delineated that we have the right to life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. Sadly, that was no longer true in 1973 with that decision by uh, Roe v. Wade on, by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, I am uh, pro-life. It's my, the number one issue. In fact, I do believe, Dennis, and correct me if I'm wrong, but three years ago, my first bill, I believe, was a heartbeat bill together with Representative St Stephanie Borowitz. She did cover that. And uh, I'm at conception. We're going to have to work away towards that. I did see when the U.S. Congress under Henry H Congressman Hyde and Congressman Smith tried to do, you know, all or nothing, and they got nothing. And now we have 60-some million uh, murdered babies. This is a national catastrophe. And so we're going to move with alacrity, with speed on the heartbeat bill, and we're going to get it down. Sadly, the 24 weeks only came to fruition, thank, you know, not thanks, but due to that awful thing that happened with Gosnell in Philadelphia. These, these houses are unclean and unsafe. Uh, I don't give uh, way for exceptions either. Uh, Kathy Barnett is going to be our next, next U.S. Senator. She is a, a product of rape. Okay, thank you. Let's move to Mr. White. Same question. Do you support any exceptions for abortion in the cases of rape, incest, or the life of the mother? You have 60 seconds. Yeah, I'm number nine of 14 children. So life started with my parents teaching us exactly what a gift life is. And I think life is a gift. I have a special needs son, my son Brian, which I speak about a lot out in the uh, campaign trail. A 33-year-old beautiful young uh, boy
with the mentality of about a five-year-old. And when I was 26 and Brian was born, I had no idea what Brian's future was going to be or our future. I was uh, probably making five, six, seven dollars an hour and was worried about what was ahead of us. But you found out very quickly how, uh, what a gift from God Brian is. Uh, Brian has a smile and smiles all day, and I tell people this. Uh, Brian has never had a bad day in his life, and we should all be so lucky. Uh, but you learn very quickly. In his smile, you can see the presence of God. So I believe every child is a gift. I believe the sanctity of life, and I would be a governor that would protect life. No exceptions? I would not have any exceptions. I would certainly work down to no exceptions at all. Thank you very much. Mr. McSwain, turning to you in 60 seconds, what is your stance on abortion? Do you support exceptions for rape, incest, or the life of the mother? I am strongly pro-life. I will be a pro-life governor. There will be seats at the table in my administration for pro-life voices. I've received the highest rating from the Pennsylvania Pro-Life Federation, for example, and I've received a lot of support from influential pro-life voices in the state, like, for example, Kathy Rapp who is the leading pro-life voice in our state house today. So I am strongly pro-life. No exceptions? Even though I am strongly pro-life, I have stated very clearly during this campaign that I would provide exceptions for rape, incest, and for the life of the mother only. Okay, thank you. Mr. Barletta, 60 yeah, seconds. Can I have 100% voting record, so you know my record is very clear. People can read it. I have a 100% voting record for life. Uh, I, I have uh, been... Uh, pro-life in every, uh, every opportunity I have. As a governor, I would sign any bill that comes to my desk that would, uh, would protect the life of, of the unborn, and I have uh, made exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. We, ha we have a follow-up question for all of you on this topic, and we're going to begin again with Mr. Mastriano in 30 seconds. Should a woman who has an abortion or a doctor who performs one be punished? 30 seconds. Uh, the doctor should be under uh, Governor Mastriano because it's going to be a crime as, as governor. Uh, we, we lack a William Wilberforce of our time who freed the slaves on, in, as a minister of parliament in England. And we don't have any champions in Pennsylvania. You know, the, the founder of uh, the Planned Parenthood, Sanger, she wanted to take out people that were, were not white. And of the 30 plus thousand abortions we have in Pennsylvania, facts are stubborn things. 17% of the population is Latino and African American provide more than half of the abortions in the state here. This is sickening to me. Everyone deserves a chance to live. Down syndrome babies in Pennsylvania, 67% are killed. This is unconscionable to me. Okay, thank you. Mr. White, should a woman who has an abortion or a doctor who performs one be punished? 30 seconds. I think we gotta work towards having no abortions. We have to be able to counsel these young, uh, young women that are pregnant, uh, that uh, come into and are thinking about abortion. We should work towards no abortions. I've been endorsed by Kirk Kondrick and Chloe, who have, uh, were the authors of Chloe's law that protects Down syndrome's babies from being aborted and using that excuse for abortion. Every child's a gift. We should work towards that, and we should not have any other way to do that. Should a doctor or a woman be punished for it? Well, the doctor should certainly be uh, uh, punished, and uh, the woman, we have to counsel. Okay. Mr. McSwain, you have 30 seconds. Prosecutor, lawyer, should a woman who has, has an abortion or a doctor who performs one be punished? 30 seconds. Well, I'm not entirely sure about the context of your question. I would say that you should only be punished if you're breaking the law. And we need to respect the law. And I'm the candidate who has always stood up for the rule of law, whether it's being U.S. attorney or in private practice enforcing the law. So you would have to look at what the law is to determine whether somebody should be punished. Um, but I actually agree with Mr. White that we need to be working to protect life and moving our laws in the right direction. But to answer your question directly, should somebody be punished for some hypothetical uh, violation? No. I okay. think you have to respect the law. Thank you, Mr. Barletta. In 30 seconds, should a woman who has an abortion or a doctor who performs one be punished under a Governor Barletta? No, I, I believe the woman should be counseled. Uh, we should do counseling prior to as well as after. And, and as for a doctor, yes. Okay, thank you. Lisa. All right, we are moving on to the topic of public safety. Mr. White, in this past session, the legislature passed a constitutional carry bill, which would have allowed Pennsylvanians to carry concealed firearms without a government issued permit. Governor Wolf vetoed it. Mr. White, in 60 seconds, if you were elected governor, would you have signed this bill? Please explain, 60 seconds. I don't need 60 seconds. I absolutely would have signed that bill. I believe our own constitution speaks to that. Uh, uh, constitutional carry, but because of our uh, radically left Pennsylvania Supreme Court, I would absolutely sign that bill so it would take them out of there. I am an absolutely uh, pro-Second Amendment. I also don't believe any local uh, localities, cities or municipalities should have their own uh, gun, uh, uh, gun laws. We are one state, 
one constitution, and we should abide by that. All right, Mr. McSwain, if you were governor, would you have signed a constitutional carry bill? You have 60 seconds. Yes, I would. And let me also say this. Okay, I'm the only prosecutor in the race. I'm the only person who has dedicated his life to public safety. And I know from my experience as a prosecutor that almost all of the violent crime that we see on our streets is committed by a very small percentage of people. They are repeat offenders. And so when you think about the Second Amendment, okay, we have to make sure we're not punishing the law-abiding citizens. We're not punishing people with increased uh, Second Amendment regulations on the people who aren't committing the crimes. Almost everybody that's committing the crimes are already convicted felons. And we need strong prosecution, we need deterrence, we need punishment to keep our streets safe. You're not making our streets safer by restricting people's Second Amendment rights. All right, Mr. Barletta, same question. You have 60 seconds. If you were governor, would you have signed the constitutional carry bill? Yes, absolutely, I would sign it. And, and again, I would protect all of our Second Amendment rights uh, as our governor, uh, I believe that, and I have a voting record again uh, of doing that. And also, uh, Mr. McSwain is not the only person up here on the stage that has fought crime. Uh, I was, I didn't fight it from a courtroom. Uh, I fought it from the streets, along with the police department in the city of Hazelton, our gangs on our playgrounds and in our alleys. Uh, I fought it when we were fighting illegal immigration. Uh, nobody in the country had the courage to do what I did, so I, I uh, take exception that uh, there's more than one person here that's done something about crime. All right, Mr. Mastriano, if elected, would you sign a constitutional carry bill? 60 seconds. I mean, this is a constitutional question. The U.S. Constitution says uh, the right to keep and arms shall not be infringed. Our state uh, constitution goes further and says shall not be questioned. And so either it's a constitutional right, a God-given right, delineated in the Constitution or not. And clearly it is. And I'm sick and tired of the radical left using tragedy to exploit their political agenda, disarm uh, honest, upstanding, law-abiding citizens. And so uh, I am gun, over, gun owners of America endorsed, and I would enthusiastically sign that legislation. I actually have several of my own bills here expanding people's rights and securing their rights. I do have a legislation in place there to prevent federal enforcement of, of uh, edicts coming out of the Biden administration that would infringe your rights and bar any law enforcement from following that up here. So the bottom line here, is we've lost so many freedoms. The motto of my campaign is John 836. If Jesus set you free, you're free indeed. It's all about personal freedom. This is what William Penn planned for our state here. And these are one of the freedoms that the left has infringed upon. The past two years, we saw the infringement on our right to gather, which we are assaulted on and you know, critiqued for doing, our right for free speech. And it's time we stand up for right. freedoms and get back to basics. Thank you. I have a 30 second follow up actually for everyone. We will begin with uh, Mr. White. If not tighter gun control, how would you stem violent crime? Mr. White, 30 seconds. You stem violent crime by uh, prosecuting the criminals. That's what's not happening in Philadelphia and other cities across this uh, state. I will bring somebody in that will prosecute the criminals. I have already have a plan out there for a special prosecutor law. We had that. It lapsed. I will have a special prosecutor. And if a Larry Krasner doesn't want to prosecute criminals and hold them accountable, I will. I will go around them, work with the local police uh, departments in whatever district it is or municipality or city, and we will put the criminals behind bars. We'll also have bonds and bail that will not just be a revolving door. All right. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, turning to you, Mr. McSwain, same question, a former U.S. attorney. How would you stem violent crime? 30 seconds. I would do what I did as U.S. attorney. I would enforce the law vigorously. It requires aggressive prosecution, it requires deterrence and accountability. And again, it's a small percentage of people that are committing almost all of the crime. And you need to take a hard line with those individuals. And as governor, we also need reform. And what, one of the things we need is bail reform. We have a revolving door of criminal justice. People get arrested for serious violent felonies, and they're out on the street the next day. We need to make sure that if you're charged with a serious violent felony, you are incarcerated until trial. All right, Mr. Barr, let us same question. What would you do to stem violent crime? We, 30 we, seconds. We need to enforce our laws, and we need to stand with our police officers. We need to make sure that our police officers not only have the funding that they need, but the respect that they deserve. Uh, you know, when I saw Governor Wolf walking in a parade with, uh, in a Black Lives Matter parade while they were holding up signs, Blue Lives Murder, it, it, it crushed me to believe it. And so the word will come from the very top that law and order, we will enforce the rule of law in Pennsylvania, and that's where it begins.
All right, Mr. Mastriano, same question, 30 seconds. If not tighter gun control, what specifically would you do to stem violent well, crime? It's, it first all stands, it's, it's withstanding with our brothers and sisters in blue that are holding a line. Those heroes every day that go out to serve the community and protect the people, and then thereby standing with them when they enforce the law and not, not turning on them as we've seen under Governor Wolf. And it's also, we're looking at here, fully funding the police, but also expanding victims protection. So many of these, these criminals get out of prison and the victims aren't even protected anymore. So that's going to be high on my agenda as well. And uh, we're going to do whatever it takes here to tighten up things, especially in Philadelphia. My eyes on that. Philadelphia should be the gem of the nation since that's where this nation was founded here. It's time to restore order and make it a place where people can visit. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Dennis. Turning now to jobs and unemployment, Mr. McSwain, you'll get this question first. Governor Wolf recently announced a plan to bring new business opportunities and more jobs to the Commonwealth by cutting Pennsylvania's corporate net income tax, which at nearly 10 percent is second only to New Jersey. Do you agree with Governor Wolf's plan to lower those taxes? And what else would you propose to entice employers to Pennsylvania? You have 60 seconds. That's absolutely double talk by Governor Wolf because he's not interested in cutting taxes. But we need to do that. And the corporate net income tax is way too high. As you said, we've got the second highest corporate net income tax in the country. Only New Jersey is higher. That is a huge disincentive for businesses to be here and to locate here. And when you look at all of our economic rankings, whether it's our tax burden, whether it's our unemployment, whether it's our population growth, whether it's the growth gap where we're not growing as fast as the rest of the country, we're near the bottom of the rankings. It doesn't need to be that way. We need someone who isn't a politician to go into the governor's office and make the hard decisions that are gonna be best for our state. And that includes cutting taxes, cutting regulations, creating a business-friendly environment, because we as the Keystone State should be one of the leaders. We shouldn't be towards the bottom. And it's only going to change if we have a conservative outsider, not more politicians as governor. Thank you very much, Mr. Barletta. Same question, 60 seconds. Do you agree with Governor Wolf's plan to lower the corporate net income tax? And how would you entice employers to Pennsylvania? Yeah, absolutely. I would lower the corporate net in income tax. We have to, and we have to reduce regulations. And I still find it hard to believe that somebody who hasn't created jobs is our best hope to create jobs here in Pennsylvania. I think we need to have somebody who actually has the experience, who's actually governed in an executive position. I'm the only one who's done that for over 10 years as the mayor of Pennsylvania. And, and we, we brought people in and businesses in Pennsylvania through uh, public-private partnerships. That was the tool that I used as a mayor of Hazleton to bring business back into Hazleton, and that's what I'm going to do as our governor. Uh, you know, there's lots that we can do in, in, in attracting businesses, but you have to be able to have the experience and, and know how to do it. Uh, we need to lower our corporate taxes. We need to get the uh, regulations down. We need to get our uh, regulatory agencies off the backs of our businesses and we have to announce to the world that Pennsylvania is open for business again and you actually need somebody who who has done that to be able to do it in our future. Mr. Mastriano, 60 seconds. Corporate net income tax, should it be reduced? And what else would you do to entice new employers to I, I wish I could believe old Governor Tom Wolf and never was a governor more appropriately named. He spent the last eight years of driving the business into the ground. In fact, he used the past years under the pretense of COVID to shut down companies and deem people non-essential while he kept his own cabinet shop open. And the only one in the state, and it was not essential. But that's okay. Full Wolf family business, they had a sugar daddy to take care of them. You know, to, to make this happen here, for eight years, Tom Wolf has increased regulations and, and taxation in some way or another uh, with fees on our, on our energy sector. So first off, unleash the potential of energy in Pennsylvania. That will drive costs down everywhere, including things that are delivered. You know, as Lou says, everything's delivered in Pennsylvania except babies. I, I love that. And so driving energy costs down is, is a start. Uh, driving down from 153,000 regulations to underneath 100,000 the first hundred days we're going to do that. Uh, this unemployment, incentivizing people to stay home and, and play uh, video games here is it's unsatisfactory. Everyone needs to get out there and work if you're able to. But we have to get the government off our backs and out of our wallets. That's how you reopen the state. That's how you open us up for business. That's how you keep kids here. Mr. White, 60 seconds, corporate net income taxes. What do you do with them and how do you entice employers to Pennsylvania? You, don't want, to you want to know how to get employers into Pennsylvania? Be a businessman. Be a guy that signed the front of a paycheck, not just a back. Be a guy that has had to made a, make a payroll and uh, been responsible for 85 to 100 people and grew a business. That's how you get it. Yes, the corporate net income tax has to come down. Not the way Governor Wolf was. It has to be a permanent solution. Infrastructure has to be fixed in this state. It is a, a disaster, our infrastructure. There's a lot of things, not just one, one item. Permitting has to be shortened. 
There has to be a time limit on permitting. Regulations have to be done away with. We have a lot of work on regulatory reform. I said I'm going to ask for a resignation of every department head in the, in the state, and they're going to have to interview for their jobs if they want to keep their job. If they're not pro-growth, pro-business, pro-Pennsylvania, and working for Pennsylvania, they shouldn't be working here. But no, uh, we also need to create a better workforce. I'm a Votech student. We have to expand vocational education so we can have the workforce needed. That's why we're, we have our population leaving Pennsylvania. We have to give them a reason to stay here. Thank you. Gentlemen, we have a follow-up question for each of you. We're going to begin with Mr. McSwain. Since the pandemic, employers have told us they're struggling just to get workers. 30 seconds. What exactly would you do to help them? Mr. McSwain. First of all, we have to have a culture of work. We should not be paying people not to work. So that, that is a, a basic precept that seems pretty commonsensical, but Governor Wolf literally paid people not to work. And uh, it starts with that, but we need to make sure that overall we are creating a business friendly environment and also having a level playing field for everybody. We want the market to work. We don't want to distort the market with different subsidies, uh, subsidies and different uh, distortions. We need to rely on the free market. Thank you. Mr. Barletta, 30 seconds. How would you help businesses who are struggling to get workers? Well, what I wouldn't do is what Governor Wolf did, literally crushed our businesses by picking and choosing who could stay open and who, who could close as if he was some kind of a dictator. Uh, I don't know what gives any governor that kind of power uh, to be able to take people's livelihoods away from them. But the first thing, and, and, and I think the easiest thing we need to do, is stop paying people to, to, to stay home. Uh, people are putting in applications right now, but they're not showing up for the interview, and that's when they should be cut off. If they do not accept the job, if they do not go in uh, uh, for, for an interview, they shouldn't be getting any money. Thank you. Mr. Mastriano, same question. What can you do to help businesses find workers? Yeah, this, this is the fruit of two years of failed Democrat policies here, using the, the guise of COVID and picking winners and losers. Box stores could be open with thousands of people, but mom and pop shops, our neighbors had to close down. You know, business owners, it's, it's who they are, not what they do. And this, this was devastating. And then this artificially driven uh, minimum wage spike, of course, that Tom Wolf has been focused on for small businesses can't, can't even compete. So we got to get the government off our backs, out of our wallets. We need to get Harrisburg to stop weaponizing DEP going down with their 46,000 permits a year they authorize here and using vague regulations here to impose their will on people and doubling the costs. Thank you. Mr. White, what would you do as governor to help businesses who are struggling to get workers? 30 seconds. Well, everything that was said just uh, prior to the, uh, me are short-term solutions. Again, we do have to get uh, people back to work. We got to stop subsidizing them to stay home. But we need to build a workforce. Uh, you need a VOTEC uh, uh, expansion, vocational education. You need to treat a pipe wrench and a college degree as equal. They both put you on a path of success. I chose a pipe wrench and did very well. I will expand vocational education in this uh, state from 3% now of students going to it should be closer to 30%. That's a way of uh, getting the workforce back and up and going. Thank All you, right. Lisa. On to another topic. You've all been critical of how the Wolf administration has handled the pandemic. It exposed the vulnerability of Pennsylvania's nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Mr. Barletta, the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association says they are underfunded, they are understaffed, and they are struggling to provide quality care. Does the system need more state funding, and where would that money come from? 30 seconds. Well, uh, absolutely. We need to make sure that, that our health care system has what it needs. But I, what I'm really concerned in Pennsylvania is, is our, our rural areas here in Pennsylvania where uh, they are struggling for health care. We need to make sure that we're uh, investing in, in rural health care centers. We need, uh, we need to make sure that we have broadband into the rural parts of Pennsylvania so that we can use telemedicine as well to get health care uh, in those areas. We have a lot of rural Pennsylvania that's underserved in our health care uh, uh, in industries. All right, 30 seconds to you, Mr. Mastriano. Do you believe the system needs more state funding? How would you provide that? 30 yeah, seconds. Th this whole thing here is as a result of the science denying policies of Levine. And Levine got a free pass on sending the sick back into the homes, which killed at least 16,000 of our elderly. I can't tell you how heartbreaking it was for me standing. No one up, uh, on, up front here was with me on the steps of the Capitol, standing with loved ones who were losing their, their uh, mom and dad, hadn't seen them for 400 days, watching them die of, of neglect. And uh, to, to think that we're going to throw money at the problem here is going to resolve it. We, we need a competent Secretary of State 
uh, and as, as Secretary of Health, more importantly, and not reward that one with, with scientific failures. All right, Mr. White, 30 seconds. Uh, do you believe the state should provide more funding for nursing homes and long-term care facilities, and where would that funding come from? Yeah, right now there's a shortfall in the nursing home uh, uh, finances of about $300 million. Uh, it's, it's actually $291 million for them to break even. These nursing homes have been the front lines during the COVID. This governor put uh, COVID patients in these nursing homes. These nurses are heroes, quite frankly, and we need to expand that. We'll expand that by using the federal money that we have now that's bankrolling, uh, is uh, in, in the uh, account right now not being spent. But we should be able to take care of our elderly. We have to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. That's what a government should do, and we would do that. All right, Mr. McSwain, same question to you. Do you believe the system needs more state funding, and how would you provide that? 30 seconds. Yes, of course. We need to take care of the most vulnerable, including our seniors. And the funding should come from the general fund. It shouldn't be any gimmicks to it. It's an important core function of our state government. And also, look at the thousands of seniors who died in these facilities during COVID. That's shameful. And the Attorney General, Josh Shapiro, did nothing to investigate it. We need to still investigate that. And that will be one of my priorities as governor. That needs to be looked into. Thank you all. What a fast hour. We now turn to closing statements. Each of you will have 30 seconds. We will go in reverse polling order. We begin with Mr. McSwain. Again, you have 30 seconds. Pennsylvania is at a fork in the road. And we need strong conservative leadership in our state. We need a conservative outsider to lead our state. We don't need more politicians. People have raised your taxes, increased spending, advocated for a COVID registry, voted for mail-in balloting, or laid off police. I am the conservative outsider. I'm a U.S. Marine. I'm a federal prosecutor. I ask you to vote Thank for you. me on May 17th, we, and let's transform our state on. together. We must move on. Mr. White, you have 30 seconds. Yes, we do need a good governor. We need someone that is like the people of Pennsylvania, a blue-collar worker that worked hard to grow a business. I'll work just as hard for the people of Pennsylvania. We've tried attorneys, we've tried prosecutors, and we've tried politicians, and it just doesn't work. It is time to have someone like us, someone like a blue-collar worker that will work hard for the people of Pennsylvania. I look forward to serving the people of Pennsylvania and will work hard for you. Thank you. Mr. Mastriano, closing, 30 seconds. We are at a flex point in our history here, and we need proven, demonstrated his, uh, leadership. The kind of leadership we saw over the past years where I stood often alone or with a handful of my colleagues to reopen a state for the elderly, for the children being masked up. Somebody has been fighting for election integrity and taking his shots, even subpoenaed by this McCarthyist uh, Democrat cabal in Congress. We need somebody who's not afraid to stand up to the left. Uh, inquire and other ones that are afraid of me. I'm going to beat Josh Shapiro and bring Pennsylvania back to greatness. Thank you, Mr. Barletta. 30 yeah. seconds. As the mayor of Hazleton, I stood on the national stage when I fought illegal immigration, when nobody in the country had the courage to do that. And I didn't back down. That's exactly what we need right now. We need someone who has the courage to fight for you. I am proven, road tested, and ready. I am pro-God, pro-gun, pro-family, pro-life, and pro-America. This will be the new Pennsylvania. This will be the great Pennsylvania comeback. Okay, we'd like to thank you all, all of our candidates for participating in tonight's debate. A reminder, Pennsylvania's primary election day is May 17th. And the winner of the gubernatorial Republican primary will face off against Attorney General Josh Shapiro, who is running unopposed in the primary. We thank you for joining us and have a great night.